So today we're going to be talking about this um, AverTech program evaluation checklist and uh, some guidelines to go with it. Um, we created a, a while back, we created a um, sort of program evaluation checklist just to give some people ideas of what to look for when they're either um, reviewing their program evaluation for their AVERS program or if they are um, just reviewing their, so reviewing or like thinking about what you need to think about whenever you're creating a new one. Um, so the checklist itself is on our website. So if you go to, come on. Um, oh, okay, so if you go to avertech.org, um, there is a resources tab over to the right. Um, and then there is, uh, if you hover over the resources tab, you'll see a drop down menu. I think the first one is like COVID-19 resources and then the second one is products and tools. And so if you click that, then the AverTech Program Evaluation Checklist and Example is up towards the top of that list. So you just click on the title and then you'll, you'll be able to download it. Okay, so, and then for, I skipped past this, but Lee, so I'm presenting, my name is Arden Day. I'm the Program Evaluator for AverTech. Um, Lee is presenting with me. So Lee, do you wanna go ahead and, and and, um, introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone had a good weekend. It's Tuesday, uh, last week of May. Can you believe that? Um, yes, I'm the project director for AverTech. Yeah. yeah, I feel like March, this is just like a continuation of March. I feel like everything is just a continuation of March at this point. <laughs> so no, I can't believe it's the last week in May. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the learning outcomes are our objectives for this. Um, so hopefully you'll have a good understanding of the importance of program evaluation if you don't already. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk a little bit about what program evaluation is. Um, we'll identify some types of information to consider when developing or refining an evaluation plan. Um, and then hopefully we'll, we'll also sort of have this understanding of some basic of the differences between and some just some basic definitions for some evaluation concepts um, and terms that you see a lot of. So program evaluation, so what is it? So this um, definition is pulled from the American Evaluation Association website. So it's just a systematic collection of information about the activities, characteristics, and outcomes of programs make judgments about the program and improve program effectiveness or and or inform decisions about future program development. Um, so usually it's it's also one of the key things about program evaluation is it's conducted according to guidelines and grounded in some basic principles. Um, so does I kind of I'm curious let's move this over here um, about what what experiences people have with program evaluation and whether you, whether you have sort of program evaluation plans in place. Um, so this is kind of just sort of gives me an idea of what knowledge base like everyone's starting out with. Um, so do you wanna just say whether or not you feel like you're sort of like a beginner like program evaluator or like no, you have no experience with program evaluation. Um, does some, do you want to, do we want to like put that in the chat box if you would? So no experience with program evaluation, sort of you've done some, so you're sort of like a beginner level. Um, and then if you're sort of like an intermediate level, you've done a, you've done a little bit of, of program evaluation, you feel pretty comfortable with it. Or if you feel like you're sort of like an expert program evaluator. Can we add that to the chat box, please? And it'll just give me an idea of where, of what people's experiences are. Kim cool. says she's a beginner. Cool. Not, not an expert, but pretty good, Wayne. That's what I'm going to go with. Mm. <laughs> Julie's a beginner. Okay. So, so some experience, so a little bit experience level, but not expert. Okay. Yep. That's Carol. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
Getting a lot Anything of beginners. Okay. Yeah. I would say I'm only an expert if I'm 75 miles away from home. <laughs> oh, you extended it, Steve. I thought it was 50. Yeah, well, you live, yeah, I live in the UP. <laughs> <laughs> We've a uh, passion palace here says that our program has had two formal contracted evaluations uh, since our inception. We had one year of ITA from AverTAC. We have several evaluations built into our current cycle. Okay. All right. Great. No. Yep. Okay. Great. So I just, this is good. Rachel says so uh, intermediate experience, low tech and feel I should beef it up. Okay. All right, but a lot, a lot of beginners. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, this gives me a good idea of, of where everyone's at, um, and sort of where I should sort of base some of this, this stuff. And so some of you with um, maybe some more experience might help, because um, while I have program evaluation experience. I don't have it within a specific AVERS program. And I, um, I know that that can be really helpful to have that sort of um, really focused experience. So, so we might have, have other people jump in and, and have a, help us answer questions as we go. Okay, um, so does everyone, so I'm gonna have you guys answer another thing in the chat box, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, can you sort of give a basic idea of like program evaluations that program evaluation plans that you have in place already with your program. So do you um, sort of just do a consumer satisfaction survey or do you also sort of, do you also try to do program evaluation based on some of your consumer numbers? Um, do you do like case file reviews can sometimes be part of program evaluation. Um, so do you sort of have a more, you wanna like just throw a few words in about, do you have like this comprehensive evaluation that covers a lot of areas or just a really focused evaluation that covers just like sort of a, a consumer satisfaction survey? Okay. Okay. Because I know sometimes when we think of, uh-huh. I know sometimes when we think of program evaluation, we just think of those consumer satisfaction surveys. But really, it's it's a lot of different things that make up sort of one um, comprehensive program evaluation. So we're going to talk about a few different things. Okay. So we've got some uh, uh, people responding now, Arden. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, so we've got, it looks like quite a few with, with a consumer satisfaction survey. Some people are using um, employer satisfaction, stakeholder surveys, mm -hmm. consumer satisfaction and case file reviews, mostly consumer satisfaction survey, but it is really, it is very hard to get those back. We've had a couple of comments about those. Right. Um, so, and actually, if y'all want to go back to, so if you're interested in getting surveys back on consumer satisfaction survey, there were a few um, suggestions that were made on our last talking circle about this. So we talked about some of that, but they're really, I, I struggle to get those to get um, satisfaction surveys as well. So there are a lot of different strategies that you can use for that. Okay. I was just going to mention, you know, a couple of strategies is, um, doing closure every time you do a closure satisfaction survey to make sure that you're connecting. Other people try, what is it, the monkey one, monkey something? Survey monkey. Survey monkey, and they provide it um, at, you know, two times a year. So there are different options to the survey, but they are extremely important and most yeah. I think yeah. you're talking about your coworker, Suzanne, when you started talking about monkeys. I'm like, hey, I'm on here. What are you doing? <laughs> only you, Wayne. Only you. <laughs> We've got a couple more in the in the chat box here. Um, yeah. And we had someone raise their hand too. Did someone raise their hand? Yeah, yeah June. June. June's hand. Did you wanna did you have a comment or a question? Nope. Unmute your phone, June. Is the hand raised an accident? All right. 
Yeah. Okay. So it looks like you got a lot of people with, yeah, a lot of people with um, consumer satisfaction surveys. And they're thinking about some self self adjust stamped envelopes with the surveys to see if that helps. I think that's a good idea. Um, making sure that they're also um, anonymous sometimes helps. So we've got some other. So it looks like Carol said they they use a comprehensive evaluation with no external evaluators that charge for their services. It's true. You can you can do your own your own comprehensive evaluation. You don't always need um, an external person. Although I know that some people are less comfortable with that. I, we we do use external people. We, they just people are, that don't charge for their services. Oh really? So they do like so so for example we have. Um, two counselors from our state agency that come in and do case file reviews. Oh, nice. We use the That's same, the CoreBridge AverTech instrument. Yeah. So it's not our staff doing their own case file reviews. Yeah, that's that's good. That's helpful. For example, I mean, they, they don't charge us anything. It's just, a, you know, mm -hmm. collegial, collegial service, I guess. Yeah, that's great. Cheers. And it's great to have someone that has the experience. Go ahead. Jerry was saying that um, to use a tablet uh, to complete while they're waiting for an appointment, to have a tablet available for them to use to complete the surveys. Yeah. And then Amanda says, we use in-house or other TVR in the state to do our eval, no charge to the grant. I got an airplane going by, so hold on. <laughs> That's not as loud as you think it is. <laughs> it's only loud for you. <laughs> um, this is Paula. We we do similar, um, we invite the states in because it increases partnership mm -hmm. to show that, you know, we, we basically have comparable services similar to theirs. Mm -hmm. the, piece, the piece that sometimes um, is missing is they don't have the cultural competency piece in, in reviewing and evaluating our program. So mm -hmm. um, we leave that to um, um, our consumer satisfaction surveys and Again, getting comments from um, consumers about um, native healing and so mm -hmm. forth. But um, generally, we utilize this similar kind of process where we invite state agency staff in and at no cost to us. Cool. That's, that's great. I didn't know that you guys did that. So that's, that's a great idea. All right. So we're going to, so now we have sort of an idea of what. Everyone's doing, we're going to, um, okay, so we're going to move on. I'm going to let Wayne chat it up in the chat box. <laughs> so um, I'm going to let Lee go over these guiding principles. Lee, you want to do this next slide? Here we go. Lee, can you hear us out there? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. there we go. Okay, do you want to do the guiding principles? Okay, guiding principles. Here we have five guiding principles listed, and I'm going to point each one out without necessarily just reading off the um, PowerPoint slide. Systematic inquiry, conduct database inquiries that are thorough, methodical, and contextually relevant. One way of looking at this first one is in program evaluation, we talk about validity and reliability. So when you're developing your evaluation plan and selection of your evaluation tool, in this instance, when we're talking about validity, this is to assure that the evaluation, plan, evaluation tool that you're using is indeed evaluating what you are set out to measure. For example, if your consumer satisfaction survey is being used, then the content of the survey should be for the sole purpose of obtaining information from your consumers. In reference to reliability of a evaluation tool, this is talking about 
replication of the process that you're using for your evaluation tool. For example, if someone was to hear about your evaluation plan and they ask you if it's accurate, um, is it valid? Can the process be replicated to arrive at a similar outcome? Those are uh, two parts of program evaluation that you would need to address or to ask yourself. Item B, competence. Provide skilled professional services to stakeholders. Here, stakeholders could mean the funding agencies, it could mean your partners, it could mean your consumers. And as part of your program evaluation, you may be looking at quality assurance. Is your evaluation tool, in a sense, evaluating the usefulness, the relevance, and the quality of your program services? Integrity, incorporate honesty and transparency in order to ensure the integrity of evaluation. We want to make sure that our evaluation tool does not pose any surprises for the individual completing the evaluation. We want to assure that the evaluation uh, does not pose any harm to anyone by disclosure of personal information. We want to make sure that your evaluation tool covers the confidentiality and privacy of those individuals who are being asked to complete your evaluation. For example, surveys, likewise, if they're participating in your focus group interviews or talking circles, it's a good idea to establish some guidelines to protect the um, individual's confidentiality and privacy. Item D, respect for people. Honor the dignity, well-being, and self-worth of individual. And most important is the cultural aspect in conducting program evaluation in your respective villages. Um, it's been said that program evaluation or conducting a survey um, takes a lot of thought and effort to design the survey itself and also recognize that the response rate may be pretty low. And we see that in programs conducting consumer satisfaction surveys. Um, some of the programs may have an advisory committee that may be involved in the development of the survey, if that's allowable. Um, we also know that in, in tribal communities, um, we tend to want to talk uh, rather than filling out surveys or um, being singled out for an interview. So consider the idea of focus group interviews uh, or talking circles where you establish a comfortable and trusting environment to engage the participants to response to the question that you'll be posing. Common good and equity is the last item. Strive to contrib contribute to the common good and advancement of an equitable and just society. As part of your program integrity, um, you also want to make sure that when you're requesting information from your stakeholders, your key stakeholders, you want, we want to make sure that we give something back to the community or to our consumers and the family members. So 
we need to make sure that as part of our evaluation plan that we have a purpose for conducting a certain evaluation activity. Moving on to the next slide. Arden. Okay, I have you would do it in this one, Lee. Do you oh. want me to? Oh, it's it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. I'm happy to. <laughs> I, I, I jump one slide. Um, I have a question for the participants out there, and the question is, why should we evaluate our program? Let's give a couple of minutes for the folks out there to respond to the question. The question is, why should we evaluate yes. our program? Um, this is Paula. Yes. Um, I think it's important to use it as a continuous quality improvement tool. Um, it's not like a gotcha kind of thing. It's, um, you know, we know our strengths, we know our areas for improvement. Um, it's more or less validating that and putting maybe amending our policies, may, maybe amending our processes for, um, for um, improving services. So if a consumer is saying it's taking too long to, for my counselor to contact me, or if we're well over our 60 day um, eligibility determinations, you use, just use that data to improve your program overall because it's about providing quality services uh, to consumers. So that's how we use it. And it's, again, it's not a gotcha kind of thing. And then we celebrate if, if the evaluators make um, comments that we have um, good documentation or we um, good use of our resources, whatever comments they make, we, we share them with the counselors and we um, also celebrate those, those areas of strength. So we've got quite a few people coming in on the chat box here. Um, Chris Christopher says that, that evaluations are a necessary tool for improvement. Sherry's uh, saying you don't know what you don't know and you don't have to be bad to get better. I think that's a really important thing to remember is that when it comes to evaluations, like Lee was saying, it's not about, and Paula was saying, it's not about being bad. It's about just seeing what's there. Amanda says to gauge how well we are doing, not doing what we need to improve. Um, Julie says to be sure we are achieving our goals. Karen says we cannot assume that we understand everything our consumers see. We have to gauge how we are doing internally so we can improve services. Carol, to learn what services or methods, et cetera, work and how well they work. <clears throat> Rachel, for one thing, we are required to share our evaluation plan in the application. So we have to carry out what we said we would. Then I agree with Paula's and others comments 100%. Hi, this is Sherry. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, hi. I just wanted to say something that I learned from um, when I was teaching school, and um, that is, whose experience is it? And I always bring myself back to that. And I, I think I know what might be best for the client, and we might work towards something, but, but it's their experience, and we don't know what we don't know. And so we have to reach out for them and ask them if we're doing things well. So um, we can do, we can work all day, every day, and get them a job, and off they go. But if that's not really where their heart is and what they want to do, and they're just following because they think that that's what they, they're supposed to do, um, we're not doing any favors to them. So I always remember whose experience is it. Great answer. And Rachel wants to steal that, Sherry. Is that okay? Steal away. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Don't I mean that's so true. You don't you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And like, you don't know what other people see, like other people have great ideas that, you know, you might never think of just because you don't have the same experiences that they do. They might see the program very differently. Yes, we got some good uh, comments. And 
from the list on our PowerPoint, some of those have been brought to our attention. Uh, the importance of evaluation to improve program design, uh, monitor our progress toward achieving goals, um, demonstrate program impact is extremely important in the purpose of conducting program evaluation. Um, also to determine whether or not your activities and your evaluation data is showing program outcomes. For example, uh, your annual uh, proposed number of consumers to be served under an I IPE and anticipated employment outcome. Uh, also to look at your program practices and see which practices or activities are most effective. Um, it's all also very useful to report back to your funding agency and to the tribal leadership um, regarding financial resources uh, and the need to project for future funding um, availability. Okay, next slide. Okay, this one is me. Um, so to help programs with sort of the world of evaluation, we created a checklist. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to evaluate a program. There are a lot of different types of models and theories and that are attached to evaluation as with any field. Um, just like there are a lot of different ways to do VR work. And there are a lot of different methods that, that you guys can use. And so the evaluation checklist um, was really just a way to kind of focus some of that information. Um, for the most part, most of us don't really need to know all of the types of evaluation and all of those different things that are that come with you know, being an evaluator, we just kind of need to know enough to evaluate our program or what we're doing right now. Um, so it sort of gives you an idea of a place to start. Um, so it's got two sections. The first section kind of covers a checklist that um, covers a lot of different types of information. And it's just sort of things to consider when developing or refining a plan. Uh, the second part is an example of an, an evaluation plan that might be included within a grant proposal. Um, so your evaluation plan might look a lot like the example or it might look a lot different. Um, and so this was, uh, we got permission from one of the programs we work with to use their evaluation, a de-identified evaluation plan to include in this checklist. And that's, that's where that, that piece came from. Uh, for the most part, this presentation that we're giving, so these slides are just going to cover um, the pieces within the checklist. Um, so the screenshot that you see here is what the checklist would is, looks like um, when you download it from our website. Um, I just put the same basic information into slides to make it, you know, look prettier um, and make it easier for us to go through. <laughs> okay. So this is, I think Lee is gonna go over this. This is what you see in the um, AVERS grant proposals, I believe. Um, before I move on, mm -hmm. uh, can we have a show of names or programs of those who have had the um, chance to review the document that Arden reviewed? Yes. How many of you had a chance to review this particular document on our website? You guys want to raise your hands or just put it in the chat box? That'd be awesome. Yeah, box. Or, um, or jump out and holler at us. Yeah. Any, any of those things. Any of those things work. <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure that we have some folks out there who are familiar with um, the checklist that we're talking about. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Hey, Let's great. See, we, have some, we have some that have and some that haven't, and that's, that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, so we're going to go over most of that information today. So, And then uh, John, a little bit further up, put it in the, put the link to where you can find it. 
and a little bit further up in the chat. Okay. Yes, we have a mix of uh, responses, so it's good to um, find out and learn that some of you folks have had the chance to review that particular document. Moving on to the next slide, what I want to share with you before I review the slide is that I got this information from the 2020 application kit for the uh, AVERS grant competition. Uh, for some of you that are reading through the slides, it may um, inform you immediately that this is part of your grant proposal as part of the quality of the project evaluation section. And for the purpose of showing this information for this particular web webinar is some of you may be working on your new five-year uh, grant application. Some of you may already be in the midst of conducting program evaluation. And sometimes it's a good idea to revisit that particular section to keep you on a, um, a good path as, as well as providing you and your program staff with a set of guidelines. And also important to know uh, if you are using an external evaluator uh, as part of your program evaluation. So what RSA looks at when they're reviewing a new five-year grant proposal uh, and what they are looking for is, for example, with item one. And if you recall from our conversation earlier, some of this information has been presented, um, situations or examples were also shared. The project evaluation, um, the methods of evaluation should be thorough, feasible, and appropriate to the goals, objectives, and outcomes of the proposed project. One recommendation I have for, the, for this particular item as you're working on your new grant proposal is as you're developing your goals and objectives, ask yourself, how would I evaluate or assess this goal and objective. So keeping that in mind as you move forward to the development of your evaluation plan. The second item talks about methods of evaluation that use objective performance measures that are clearly related to the intended outcome of the project and will produce quantitative and qualitative data. Item number three, the extent to which your program evaluation will provide pro performance feedback and permit periodic assessment of progress toward achieving intended outcomes. Next slide. Okay, so, oh wait, no, this is you. Sorry, go ahead, Lee. <laughs> okay, questions to consider. Um, this is going out to the participants. How often do you review evaluation data and progress toward your goals and objectives? We'll allow some time for some comments. Um, this is Paula. I would say a minimum of quarter, quarterly, um, but sometimes um, during the team meetings, counselors will review their data um, monthly during their team meetings. Okay, anyone else? Don't be shy.
So I'm I, like what kind of you know I mean, there's more than just written evaluations. There are other internal um, methods of evaluating. Uh, maybe during staff meeting, are you evaluating a particular process? Um, uh, during your outreach, are you looking at uh, the need for outreach or maybe you need to pull back because you have too many consumers and you can't pay for everything? Um, well, yeah, and there are different types of, I think Sudan is really getting at this, there are different types of evaluation and sometimes like we only think of one, one thing when we think of program evaluation. And really there are lots of different ways that we're kind of evaluating the, or the programs that we work with or the programs that we work in um, that are like not, that you don't always consider like program evaluation, but are, are part of evaluating your program. Sorry, Sudan, I, I mean, you're up, but I just wanted to agree with you. <laughs> well, Ruby puts down, I keep track of our data. Mm -hmm. So um, what, how does, if you're keeping track of data, how is that reflected um, for maybe improvement or not improvement? Where is that information being shared with the rest of the uh, members of the Fort Mojave Indian tribe team. Um, basic data. Um, we review our basic data monthly in a team meeting. There you go, there's a, a way of doing it. I expect counselors to run a weekly report on their own case and help themselves, to help themselves see where they are. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna take over there? <laughs> Carol says that we start every day with a staff meeting. Um, Ethel was saying that before COVID-19, we were scheduled to have case management meetings bi-weekly. And Ruby followed up with, we have monthly meetings to make sure we're on target with our program. So in this yeah. situation, I know there's several programs that have been writing for their, their grant application. Um, luckily, which uh, was extended. So that's awesome till June 26th, just making sure everybody heard that. <laughs> Uh, well, if we didn't, we're in big trouble. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it, would have been, it was due today. <laughs> right. Right. So um, in this time of COVID, it, it's really interesting for me to talk to different project directors and staff on how they're still collecting this data. You know, we, we aren't face to face. We aren't able to meet on our, our regular monthly or, or weekly setting for team meetings. How are you guys doing that now? And Rachel responded, it can depend on which component. We get more satisfaction surveys at certain times and then those that trickle in one by one, we look at, we, that we look at right away. Um, for the light file monitoring, it's a regular basis, yet when the eval tool is used quarterly, then that additional info gets looked at. Yeah. Okay, so other other questions to consider or to ask yourself? Um, what are my programs, goals, outcomes? Who are our stakeholders? What information is needed? How do we define success? To whom should the measurements and data be provided? What is our baseline? Mm -hmm. uh, Arden, um, can you share um, or provide some explanation regarding the baseline and how we're doing it for our project? Yeah, so we, um, like for us, um, we mostly collect, so we look at pre and post. So baseline is really trying to get at, and dislike the word baseline for a couple of reasons, but um, at one point people were using it a lot, but no one was able, able to really tell me what it meant. But basically the idea behind baseline is that it's where you start. So you're looking at where you start. And so usually it's, you're looking at something as a pre-measure so that you can do a comparison later on to see whether your activities, your program activities made a difference. So for us, we really look at, 
a pre and post in terms of our um, our intensive technical assistance and whether our intensive technical assistance activities have made a difference with the programs that we're working with. So we use that by, um, we look at sort of before and after measures of um, annual report numbers. We also look at whether we see improvements in, so um, a lot of you guys have talked about the case file review tool on the chat. Um, and I know that we've done some presentations around this, but so we use a, a case file review tool, like checklist tool with all of our programs. And so we also look at whether or not um, that, that consistency with the case files and the, and the consist consistency with which um, pieces are documented, we look at and see whether that changes over time. So that baseline number really gives you just that comparison number. Um, of where you start and then where you end or where you're like if you're in progress of something it sort of gives you a midpoint data um, but it's just sort of that comparison point is what baseline data gives you um, and that can look like a lot of different things there are a lot of different data pieces that can contribute to a baseline number um, and maybe you don't really know what to expect um, with a baseline number, you just think that something's going to change and you're not really sure what, so you collect a lot of things um, to sort of try to look at that improvement. So, does that answer did that answer the question, Lee? Wayne is off unmute. Yeah, so I, I asked, I just asked if that answered the question, but it looks like we have some other people that said, um, looks like Carol said that their IT per department um, have has assisted them with connecting to their client database from home, from their home laptops. No, it took them minutes. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it was they amazing. Direct, they yeah, had direct they, access. <laughs> once they got to us, it was, and we, you know, we went, we left, we, we expected to be home for three weeks. Right. And three week point is like, okay, this isn't really working. You know? Right. Um, and, you know, we were doing, we're doing things and, it, you know, the, it, being able to access your database and you're able to do case noting and collect information um, was really valuable to us and to the way we, we could continue to provide services during this time. Yeah. Um, I was talking about this today with our counselors and we, you know, and it's just, and, um, Casey said, she said, you know, IT never says no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they said, we'll do it. That's what they say. We'll do it. And somehow they do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I feel like in, in some respects, IT has really had to step up in this COVID-19 yes. COVID world. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. It looks like some people aren't, aren't able to really do much monitoring since the offices are closed. So, so that's good that, you know, some people are able to, so that you're able to like really connect to your, to your client database. That's amazing. Cause I don't know that everyone has well, that. It, that it, was helpful, it, it was helpful for me because I went writing our grant as well during this time. Oh and yeah. <laughs> when I left for three weeks, I grabbed everything I could think of in my laptop, but a lot of my documents were on my mm -hmm. desktop computer. Right. And it, that, do I really, and I, I really ask myself, do I really need to take the risk of going into my office to get this document or will I just do without it? <laughs> right. You know, and right. so I decided I was going to do without it because it really wasn't worth the risk to me. To right. Enter right. back into that environment. And um, so having to be able to access, and what I found out was those documents weren't all that valuable to me anyway. <laughs> 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 kind of moved on, you know, but I, I, in my head I thought, I really need this piece of information, you know? <laughs> right, right. I mean, you really figure out what, what you really need and what you don't. Yeah, and I, I just, I guess I've been amazed generally how all our tribal departments have really stepped up. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, think that's, I think that's really true. Yeah. All right, great, great interaction there, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, moving along, um, what we're recommending uh, for you to consider is uh, review your evaluation section of your grant proposal. Uh, what did you say you were planning on doing? Are you familiar with the GEPRA measures? 
program project measures that are outlined in that section. Also identify and review current progress, asking yourself, have data been collected already? Also determining and reviewing your data as it's coming in. What is your program doing well? Are you collecting information to maintain those practices? Does your data inform you of areas for improvement? One recommendation I have is whether or not you, you're a new program uh, is data collection and management needs to start on day one. You need to work on this important piece of your program component. Moving on to the next slide. This is the GEPRA performance measure for the tribal VOC rehab programs. And this information was also taken from the 2020 application kit. Some of you may be familiar with uh, the process for collection of data to answer these questions or requirements. Um, this is related to your annual performance report. And for those who are just now getting more familiar with the program evaluation piece, Again, it's really important to become familiar with this requirement and to seek out to your AVERS community and ask for their best practices in the um, collection of data for the GEPRA uh, performance measures. I don't want to read each individual uh, factor or criteria what I'm more interested in is hearing from the program directors or those folks who are part of the program staff in what they consider uh, best practice or a practice that is working for them to capture the data for the GEPRA performance measures. This is Carol, all, all this information really um, is available in our database, our client database for another, number two. Um, number one would be the same thing. And three and four, I just did for, um, to figure it out for myself, just to see where we were. And that's pretty easily, that's just your whole budget, um, your federal budget plus your match divided by the number of people you serve that year. And then the same thing would be for the number of people that, um, were successfully closed, employed. So that's just a simple math problem, really. And this is, I don't know that we've reported this at the individual, at the annual level before. This has been, we reported the, uh, three and four at the five year. I, and I think that's correct. Is that for all your program directors out there? And then I don't know if that's gonna be uh, required each year now or not, but that was, I checked with our state to see how that they did it, and that's what they told me they did too. So that's my understanding. Yeah, it looks like Winona said that that's her understanding too, that it's only for the final report. Right. Mm -hmm. So that GEPRA measures can have different like reporting requirements on them. But it's, it was nice to do because I figured it out for the last, I mean, I figured it out for my five year report next year just by taking that. The, the amount, the budget amounts for the last four years to see where we were. Mm -hmm. So before I think I waited till the five year report and figured it out. Because <laughs> I was never asked before then. <laughs> so, well, I mean, it's, it's kind of a good, good practice to be able to look at your, what that is annually too. Right. So even if you don't have to report on it. Really. And I think we've all been flat funded for the last five years. We've been flat funded for the last 10 years. So um, that makes a real difference. So <laughs> it makes the math easy when you're flat funded. Right. <laughs> right. 
You guys got some chatter in the in the box here. I see that. Arden. Um, so I don't know that I can answer some of these questions, but. Um... So Rachel responded to Nona, uh, one is for 26s and one is 28s, uh, which are successful and unsuccessful for the newbies, us uh, experienced VR people, because I don't like to say old or long-term <laughs> uh, VR people. Then, then you would be old too. Yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> I want to be experienced. I don't want to be old. Um, that's successful and unsuccessful closures. Uh, and then Amanda says during COVID that she's been talking to Philip every week, sometimes three to four times a week, just to stay in touch. Um, and then they're also seeing if they're, you know, how their clients are doing and, and if there's other needs outside of VR, like food and supply needs mm -hmm. and got them other resources as needed. And it looks like she's back in the office, but her staff will return later due to his age. Ethel asked the question, um, how long has this data been required to be reported? That is on previous grant periods. Question, you know, um, I'm going to let somebody else jump in and answer that one. That C, I don't, um, two C, uh, individuals continuing, that means the people that are currently in your program, but they've neither left on successful or they're continuing or are successful. So they're going on into the next um, grant or next annual period. Or they, you know, in the case of the five-year grant, they, if you get refunded, then they continue on. I don't remember having to report that before. I do the other two. But. Sherry states that it's as long as she can remember. If she okay. Had to report on well, this. there I am. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't mean my memory's not that great. Okay, but call, call brain, <laughs> Amanda <laughs> says, "Yeah, forever." <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Well, is it one of those? I know that some of the ones that you guys, some of the reporting that you guys complete is like automated. So I wonder if it's, I don't know. No, it's not. No, that's not. That part, okay. the five year report isn't very automated. Yeah, okay. It's a different system. Mm hmm. All right, Lee, are we ready to move on? Seems like uh, Lee got kicked off. He just sent an email. Trying oh, to no. Oh, no. Sorry to hear that. Okay. Christopher says, um, I'd imagine that number three and four dollar amounts would change over time. You know, it would be nice if there would be adjustment, um, especially for, you know, inflation. And then like, even now we're uh, with, with the pandemic stuff happening, our, I, f I have a feeling that we're going to be spending a lot of money um, in our programs on, on updating computers and getting virtually connected to, to be, um, to get in, to gain employment. So I'm thinking they're going to have to look at this at some point, but unfortunately they haven't looked at it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder if it would make more sense to have it be like a percentage of. Sherry's reminding us that the state agencies have to answer these questions as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So Lee um, just emailed me and said that his computer has stopped again and he has to reboot it to get back up. Oh no. Um, okay. Well, so I've why got don't the you, next, we'll get yeah. the next couple of slides. So why don't we? We'll support you, Arden. All right. Or we'll Promises just let you promises. flounder. Whatever. I know. Fast. I don't. I don't. I don't trust you, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so this is sort of like the next section. So we start. This is the next section that's in the checklist. Um, so we started sort of with those um, sort of what just reviewing where you're at, reviewing what you've already got, um, and then sort of some different measures, different types of measures. So generally people break them down into two different measures, um, two different types of measures. So there's formative and then the next slide will go over summative measures. Um, I found this really cute little little cartoon that I split up here and I stole it from this blog, just FYI. Um, <laughs> But formative measures are measures that can be used to make improvements to the program. They're usually ongoing and intermittent. 
Um, and some examples can include things like the case file reviews that you guys have mentioned some of you doing um, can be used for formative evaluation because you can look at areas where maybe you're weak or maybe where a specific VR counselor is weak in their case files and sort of look at improving those pieces as you go. It doesn't have to be sort of this one end, end measure. It can be an opportunity for, for improvement. Um, personnel evaluations are, are formative measures as well for the same reasons. Um, you can look at what, what you're doing well and what areas can be improved. Um, quarterly reporting um, sort of is as that ongoing sort of intermittent checkpoint um, can provide you with good information that you can improve on. A lot of you guys also talked about sort of those monthly staff meetings where you review consumer numbers or you review case files and things like that. That's also a form of formative evaluation. Um, gives you an opportunity to problem solve and talk about areas for improvement, gives you an opportunity to celebrate your successes and things that are going really well, and then also figure out how to take those successes or things that you do really well and apply them in other areas where maybe you're, you're, not, you're not doing as well and figure out how to overlap those pieces. So that's really what formative measures are, are trying to do. Talking circles, focus groups, and interviews, so that qualitative, that rich qualitative data that you can get from that um, can really give you a lot of information about what your program is doing really well. And then er again, areas to improve, that's what most of this is. And it also gives you suggestions and ideas and things and like a very different perspective of your, of your own program that you might not get otherwise. And so that qualitative data really adds depth I think to um, sort of the quantitativeness or those those numbers that that I think that we are required to report on all of the time, um, but it really adds more of that more of that story about why things work the way that they do and why things work well and why things didn't work well. Uh, consumer satisfaction surveys we talked about those as well. Um, so having um, so having that information and that can give you both quantitative and qualitative qualitative measures. Um, does anyone else have examples of other sort of formative things that they do to help improve their program or formative measures? Um, I know that I went went through a lot. I should have asked you guys before I went through my list. Um, <laughs> but do you guys have other other pieces that you use as formative measures? to the chat box mm -hmm. unmute yeah nothing's coming in yet i know <laughs> um well we've got em employers and stakeholders oh yeah yeah the, the employer and stakeholder um oh. surveys or interviews and focus groups that way definitely and also a lot of times um uh, programs will have directors meetings with their council, mm -hmm. tribal council members, and um, during that time, there's also a way of learning how the community, how your tribal council and your peers are um, view your program or don't understand your program, and you may find yourself educating. That's a good way to evaluate um, how your you know, how you're perceived in the community. Also, if, if a director is on the state rehabilitation council or if they're on the state independent living council or any other council for the state, that is another, um, I know it's an outside, but it's a stakeholder, but think of some of those that, or if you're working with um, the state VR, you're, you have a close relationship with your state VR agencies those are all really um, good methods to feel the water in terms of how you're, uh, how you're perceived, how your program is perceived, and, and what things that you can do um, to make some improvements. I found those to be very valuable. Yeah, and I'll give you, yeah, I think that it would give you a lot of good ideas for services that you provide to consumers, as well as ways that you might um, sort of 
recruit is the wrong word, but do different outreach um, to the community and sort of help you drive, drive some of that plan as well. So um, looks like someone mentioned that they've held forums in the past. Um, which could it could be considered a focus group. It's sort of just a different different way to do that. Current and past consumers and or family members, providers, partners usually have at least one consumer success story featured in person. Yeah, it's a great way to get success stories. Forums, focus groups, interviews are a great way to get get some of those success stories. You know, when I was uh, in the community, we'd do community events, participate in like uh, health fairs and those types of things, and I would create a, a separate. Um, survey form not necessarily a consumer satisfaction survey but more along the lines of uh what do you know about a survey type form and mm -hmm. um so we, we would have people come by the booth and and that was one of the things we'd hand out and you know we also tied it to um our staff would bring in like fry bread and stuff like that that they'd make at home so we if you wanted to fry bread or indian tacos or or whatever we had you had to you had to fill out the survey to get it and so we had quite a success rate with uh, um, our, our informational survey. Now I'm just hungry. I know it's going to be lunchtime here in Montana. I know. Yeah, it's, it's past lunchtime here. I haven't eaten yet. It's a mistake, guys. It was a mistake. Okay. <laughs> on that note, we're going to move on to summative. <laughs> Looks like Comanche VR has a great one that they use for, for those types of events as well. So event, event story or event um, surveys. Um, summative measures, so this is sort of the flip side to formative. Formative sort of helps you inform your program. Summative is sort of like that end measurement. Um, so measures which can be used to assess the final impact of the program usually occurs after project activities occur or at some sort of specific point. So um, you're thinking about annual reporting um, those consumer employment and education outcomes. Um, so those are really your summative, some of your more major summative things. Um, and then, so the consumer eligibility determinations and typo, and um, sort of IPE development. So all of those like consumer numbers sort of get at um, those summative measures. Um, so does anyone else have, oh wait, it looks like someone else mentioned that they had a company-wide survey handed out to all, all clients. Um, survey how their meeting with the staff was on any given day. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, so a great check-in with consumers. Um, June put in there that she uh, has had focus groups that worked well in the past. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Good to admin and we received a report last month with with a summary. Huh, that's very cool to do just sort of like random check-ins um, to do that experience survey. Mm -hmm. So does anyone else have? So those are so those are some more formative pieces. Um, does anyone else have sort of other summative measures that they look at other than? Um, I mostly focused on like consumer consumer employment outcomes and consumer numbers, but are there other formative or summative like end measures that you guys think about or look at whenever you're whenever you're doing your annual reporting or your final reporting, depending on where you're at? You have transition services. Transition services. Mm-hmm. How they stay connected with the youth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think budget expenditures are it's always important because you know mm -hmm. you're expending fun, funds on services and um, you need to keep track of how much budget you have left and compare it with you know are you meeting your employment outcomes so. Mm -hmm. Christopher jumped on here and um, put in, I think, uh, formative, as, formative as on the fly, intending to make changes while doing the work, while well, summative is, the, is at the formal conclusion. So to me, the consumer summative is their satisfaction survey they do when they close successfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. And it can be used in, so a lot of these things can be used in two ways. They can be used in both a formative way to help you inform future services 
and they can also be used as sort of these overall summative measures. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be one or the other. <laughs> Amanda uh, stated that she tallies all replies from consumer satisfaction surveys and writes a summary for the annual report. Mm -hmm. And this is included in the five years of summaries in the final report when writing the next grant. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is Carol. My chat isn't chatting, so um, we've, been, we've been doing more with partners. <laughs> we've been trying to um, connect more with our partners and I, I think over time as, as the tribe has grown I'm, and I'm talking over time over several years mm -hmm. we've gotten um, more into our silos of our departments and less into the interaction that we used to do more naturally because there were few and few programs and we you know weren't as structured as we are in today's world mm -hmm. and so we've made a really effort to work to reach out to people and then um for uh, referrals and for, um, you know, because um, there's so many shared clients that most of our direct service programs work with clients and families, I should say. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the end to see where, where, where we're we most effective in getting referrals and talking to our partners. And um, I spent a lot of time in April talking to partners um, and just I mean, directly just talking to other managers and saying, well, you know, how could we work together more in the future? What things could we do now? And they're all very interested in, in doing that. But it's just, I, I found working from home, I had, had the time to have the conversations that mattered. And, and it was very, very interesting. And I, I, it's, it's, it was very informative to, um, to me and to our program and to their programs, because we, we talked about the numbers of people we're all serving and they're, you know, we're a small tribe, <laughs> and like one of our one of our main referral sources are Head Start parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. You know, which wouldn't typically be something you'd think about. Well, how about the substance abuse program, or you know, how about you know the probation or parole or whatever? But you know, we found those were yeah the There's Head Start parents and and the Head Start grandparents because so many of the grandparents have custody of kids. Yeah. That's true. That's something we hadn't looked at much in the past, but in today's world, that's changed. That dynamics changed. Mm -hmm. So where the, where those things are coming from, where those consumers are coming from. Mm -hmm. Right. Definitely. So there are definitely some some creative ways to look at look at your what you're measuring and what you're looking at. Okay. My name is one me, but I only have 15 minutes, so but I think we're almost done. <laughs> Um, so, um, sort of the, the last piece that's listed within that checklist, and again, just sort of like an overview of where to start, um, is sort of starting to identify a work plan. Um, so identify timelines for data collection, figure out who's going to collect or gather information. I know that we had this sort of ongoing discussion throughout today of the internal versus external evaluator. Um, so who, who is going to do which tasks and at which times and what, that, what that's going to look like. Um, figuring out how you're going to collect and analyze the information. So once you have that information, what do you do with it and how do you report on it in a way that makes it make sense. Because um, sometimes, like I know that we all have annual reports, but then there are sometimes reports to stakeholders that we want to provide as well. And so how are you going to how are you going to re report on, analyze that information and then report on it in that way as well. Um, thinking about also as you go through this and identify your work plan, um, if there was a work plan that's been included in, in your grant, so making sure that you go back and review that as well. And were benchmarks included in that work plan in the grant and are you meeting those pieces? Um, there are, this was one of the ones that Lee was supposed to do. Lee was supposed to do these two bullets. Um, <laughs> uh, so then also for that, that last one, identifying how you're going to collect and analyze information. A lot of um, case management software has a lot of the information that you need to report on. And so um, if you're using the case management software to its fullest ability so that you can use all of this, that, uh, 
all of those pieces, whichever case management software you're using or Excel system or whatever you are using, making sure that you're using all of those pieces so that you can just pull out a report at the end. I know that a lot of them can do that. Um, and then thinking about how, um, how you're planning to use it. So I know that also some of the feedback I get is that people have thought about using a case management software but haven't committed to one yet and now are in a position where they can't really commit to one <laughs> for at least the time being. And so thinking about, you know, if you haven't, if you don't have a system in place, what that might look like for your for your program. And I know that a lot of our AberTAC staff, if you email us, can help with, with some of those pieces as well, figuring that out. Um, so, and then finally, like, how are you gonna make decisions based on your evaluation results? So thinking about um, when you review that data, what does that data mean and how you're planning on making improvements to your program based on those, some of those formative pieces that we talked about, or even some of the things that would normally be considered summative. So I know that a lot of you guys talked about reviewing consumer numbers um, on, at monthly meetings or at, quarter, at a quarterly basis. And so what do you do when those numbers aren't where you expect them to be? And how do you make decisions? And what, are, what do those decisions look like? And who's involved in that? Um, so making sure that you have sort of ideas or plans or you start thinking about some of these questions. Um, Wayne mentioned that when he looks at questions for the data collection, he works backwards from, from the needed data so you look at the info you need and then you begin developing questions to get those answers. So that's a really good way to do it. Um, so Amber asked what, what data programs all of the tribes are using. So I know the two most popular ones are they, and I'm gonna get this wrong, one of them is now Boca Tech, and I don't remember which one. And then is it AWARE? Did AWARE become Boca Tech or is AWARE the other one? Okay, so it's Boca Tech and AWARE are the two, <laughs> two main ones. <laughs> it used to be, it used to be, Boca Tech used to be a, da a data ops, but now it's different. Um, and then Sherry asked whether or not um, people use qualitative data and how you measure that. Um, so I'm going to give a brief answer to this because I've done a lot of qualitative, I've done a fair amount, a lot, a fair amount of qualitative work, both in evaluation and research. And so usually what I do whenever I'm looking at qualitative data for, um, for um, like evaluation is I'll look for some of those major themes. So if you do interviews or focus groups, you're going to want to look for what pieces come out really consistently. Um, and then how frequently, so some people will measure how frequently it comes out, but really just like looking at what themes come out um, from like focus groups or interviews. And so you're just, you're gonna wanna look for like major ideas from those pieces. So it's kind of what, so it's less of a, it's less of a number, it's a little bit more squishy. <laughs> um, Looks like someone's moving to AWARE from Boca Tech. Yep. Wayne, thanks for recommendation from Joanna. <laughs> and looks like June's asking if anyone is using TAS. Oh, there's some other ones. TAS, Sherry says don't use right track. <laughs> All right. We're seeing more and more uh, programs coming out um, amongst mm -hmm. the different tribes, especially where we have several tribes that are, um, uh, I gotta say this carefully, um, housing AVERS programs under their 477. You want to concentrate, Sherry? And the uh, 477s are using their own database, and then those programs that are housed there are required to use that database as well. Um, so it's hard to say right now um, a, a definitive list. There's several different programs out there. And this is Sherry, and I, yeah, I was a little um, blunt there, but um, it, it really does. They, this program is not um, 
a tribal program. They knew nothing about tribal VR, so we had to tell them everything. And the things that we do and we um, qualitative and quantitative data that we gather, it just doesn't work for with them. And we're spending hundreds of dollars a month trying to get them to understand what it is that we're looking for. Um, so I think that there are new programs out there, but they're not in Indian country. They're, they, they, don't, they don't get that things are done differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, and it super sucks. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's, this is Carol. I, as I said, my chat's not chatting. So, but for us, I mean, having that that tribal friendly database, basically, once our data is you know entered, we keep up on it. The case notes, the you know all the statistics are. I mean, first, you have to enter it into into your system, or it isn't you know you won't have uh, the results, but you know, in a minute, we can have every piece of data we need for all that quantitative information in our annual report. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we've been around long enough, Sherry, that we, 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 were, we were counting on fingers and toes, you know, and um, to have that information in the format we need it that answers specifically the questions, <laughs> I, I think is just so amazing. And I don't know. I've always, I mean, I've only only used data apps, Boca Tech, whatever, but they're um, they're very reasonable. I, I'm surprised how cheap that that system is. I, I I had I double checked the figures when I was doing the grant application this year. Yeah, it's, it's like something like I don't know, including training, five thousand dollars or something. Seriously. <laughs> oh my lord. <laughs> now now I am cranky. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I kind of looked at him like, because, you know, it's like, oh, okay. I mean, you know, I really looked at that. And I, this is, I, you know, we double checked and said, what, should, you know, what is your, the next five years? What do you look at? They did the estimate for the next five years. And it's like, I, I'm, I was amazed. I was pleasantly surprised. So, Good. I'm a happy camper. Yeah. We <laughs> like when Carol's happy. <laughs> yeah. And it looks like some people are, are using a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. to collect data and create tabs for the new year. Yep. Mm -hmm. We see that. So, I mean, having some sort of electronic system is helpful, I think. Whether that's a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet that works for you, or whether that's, you know, a data, a data system, a database system that works. Right. You need a um, database system. One, one, one that you make up or one that somebody does or somebody that yeah. you buy from somebody. It's too yeah. much information to, um, and all the correlations and cross-referencing and, mm -hmm. you, you know, it's hard to do that on a spreadsheet. Yeah. Well, and I think that um, so you have to be really super fancy with spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I think... did, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it really think... depends on the size of the program too. I mean, some right. programs, you know, like my, when I, when I was running with Northern Cheyenne, we didn't, we didn't have the client base to to, have, to to justify a database, so we we did it on Excel and and other um, other programs that we developed ourselves. And that's you know, right? Rachel was saying for those tribes um, that have the capacity or capability, some IT departments develop their own database. Um, and then June, I'm not sure if there's a list of of these databases on the market. I don't know. Um, well, that's um, a good question. Uh, one of the things um, from my past experience is that, for instance, Boca Tech or Aware, either one of them, um, and TAS for that matter, um, all of them are willing to provide some kind of overview of their program. I remember years ago, Database used to have a small CD they used to distribute to somebody if they wanted to learn more about their program. I don't know whether now Boca Tech is doing anything like that, but um, it's, a, it's a product and they're selling something. So they would be willing to provide you um, information and they're on, and they should be, and they're on the web. I think your next question was uh, to look them up on the web. That was Joanna. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's that's what you gotta do is just do some little Googling. So, okay, so we're running out of time. So I just wanted to, um, can I select this? Of course not, that would be too easy. 
Okay, so this is the, um, I just wanna remind you guys to complete the survey. Um, see if I can put it in here. Were there any other comments or questions or um, great ideas that, that hasn't been covered that somebody would like to kind of close with? So as we spent the last hour and a half talking about program evaluation um, and consumer satisfaction surveys, uh, we, we really need you guys to fill ours out. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay, that should be the right link. Well, let me copy it. So Rachel, you yeah. uh, we're in Boca Tech, will schedule a demonstration um, like on a go-to um, go meeting or Zoom meeting. So you got to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, okay. So, so please, yes, please complete our survey. Please reach out to the database um, people. They, I mean, most people that are selling softwares are usually willing to meet with you. And if they're not willing to meet with you to sell their software, then they're not gonna be willing to meet with you when you have trouble. So might give you a good idea of who you wanna work with. Um, there are those things. We do have an upcoming webinar tomorrow, I believe that um, is with the Northwest Indian College TVR Institute, um, the Abers Fiscal Management Toolkit that they did. Um, so if you are not, so it's, um, we included a link in our weekly update via email if you're not getting our weekly updates or if you know someone else who's not, then you can go ahead and email us at abertech at nau.edu. And if you have just any general questions about this webinar or any general questions for us, just, you know, shoot us an email. And we are here online all the time. <laughs> wow, that was enthusiastic. <laughs> I'm getting a little depressed about Zoom, can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> so everybody but Arden is ready and willing to work with you. Just hey, I'm willing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate you. you coming and attending. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Take Thanks. care. Bye. Thanks for your input.